Today I'm just going to jump right into it before I say something else foolish, right into the text that my sermon is based on. So if you care to look at it with me, please take your Bible and find Matthew chapter 1, verse 9. Matthew chapter 1, verse 9. Maybe you have it memorized and don't even need to look it up, but um, if you want to follow along, Matthew chapter 1, verse 9. And this is the Bible text I'd like to focus on today. Right at the beginning of the New Testament of the Bible, second portion of the Bible, Matthew chapter 1, verse 9, of course says, Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Yep, it's just one of those Bible texts that's so powerful, you know, so profound and packed with deep meaning, it's basically a sermon in and of itself. I mean, what more could I really add to that? We could easily just sit here quietly for the next 30, 40 minutes and just contemplate the many lessons and insights inherent in these words that we've just read, couldn't we? But of course, if I were just to leave it at that, you might be tempted to think or even suggest to me that I'm not doing my job. So, I guess we better look into this a bit more. Sorry if you were thinking you were going to have an early exit. Let's look at this. As you might already know, these four people that are listed here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 9, were four of the men in the genealogical line that went right through from Abraham right through to Jesus Christ. And you might also be aware of the fact that these four particular men were also not just any old men, they were also all kings of Judah. And their stories are recorded in the Old Testament portion of the Bible, thankfully. Otherwise, I would really be scratching at something to say at this point. Now, if you happen to be reading this passage in Matthew from the King James Version of the Bible, you might not initially recognize these names as being the same as that of the kings listed in the Old Testament. And this is because that version has the names in the Greek form of their original names, which accounts for some slight variation in how the names are presented. So, it says Uzziah, but it wasn't just Uzziah, this was King Uzziah, or King Azariah. It seems that he was called by both of these names. I think he might have been Jamaican or something. You know, he had his name, and then he had his his name that everybody used. I don't know how that worked, but um, I don't think he was really from the Caribbean, but who knows. Anyways, he had two names. And likewise, it's not just Jotham and Ahaz. It was King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. And maybe that's the name we're more familiar with. The story of these men can be found in 2 Kings, beginning at chapter 15, and then it's told again in 2 Chronicles, beginning at chapter 26. So what I would like us to do today is simply look at these men's lives, take kind of a review, an an overview of their reigns as kings of Judah, and, and see what we can discover. We'll start the story with Uzziah, but I personally find his other name, Azariah, be a little more pleasant to my ear and to my tongue, so I'm just going to call him Azariah, all right? Even if it's not all right, I'm just going to call him Azariah. Can you imagine this, this young man, he was only 16 years old when his father Amaziah was killed and the people made him king. Can you imagine having a 16 year old boy ruling your country? Now, I don't know, some of you might be thinking, well, You know, that maybe is not much worse than some of the things I've seen in country leadership in my life. I don't know what you're thinking about that. But whatever the case, maybe think of it the other way. Can you imagine being 16 years old and being in charge of a country? I mean, sometimes when you're you're 16, you think you know everything anyways, but can you imagine having that responsibility? It's incredible. But it seemed that Azariah did a pretty good job because he reigned for 52 years. He just cruised right by even our present-day retirement age. That was a pretty long reign for those days. Like his dad, Azariah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Well, almost at least. He wasn't perfect. You see, there was a problem that had been going on in Judah ever since Azariah's great, great, great grandfather, King Asa, 
had ruled over Judah. And here was the problem. Before Solomon's temple was built, the people, you know, they had to offer their sacrifices. They needed to perform their acts of worship somewhere. And so there had been certain designated places set aside for doing so. And those places had become known as high places, places to worship. But the deal was that after the construction of the temple, what was supposed to happen is these, these people were supposed to go to the temple. That's where they were supposed to direct their attention as a center of worship. That's where they were to take their sacrifices and where they were to do their worship. And um, they were, what was supposed to happen is after the temple, these high places were supposed to be abolished and people were supposed to go to the temple instead. These high places, it seemed, had become perhaps like what many toll roads have become in North America, if you've traveled around North America. They were originally intended to be temporary, but somehow became established as permanent. And so the problem was that the people were still going to these high places, even though they had the temple. And, and more than that, it wasn't just that they were still going there. What made matters worse was that in many of the places, the worship that was happening at these places was becoming very corrupt very idolatrous. It was not a, a good situation at all. Now, we're not going to be able to read through all of the stories of all of these men today. Maybe you would wish to do that later today or sometime next week. Hopefully, you will take an interest in their stories. But for today, we're, we're not going to read through all the stories, but I would like to, to read a few summary verses about these men, some kind of summary statements that give us a little snapshot of what kind of people they were. And so let's look at something about Azariah. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 5. Let's see what it says about Azariah. 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament, chapter 26, and verse 5. These accounts of the kings, often at the beginning or near the end of them, they'll give kind of a summary statement, basically saying, was this king a, you know, a good guy, a good king, or a bad guy, a bad king? We want to just look at some of those to get a sense of what these men were like. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 5, it's talking about Azariah or Uzziah. And it says there, He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. It's a pretty good lesson right there. As long as... As he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. That's simple, straightforward, but if you think about it, it's also profound. So Azariah continued to reign, and since he reigned for such a long time, he became, he became quite famous and well-known. He became a very powerful king. He um, had, had accomplished a lot of things. He built many great things. He, you know, he had a, a long reign, so he developed a stable kingdom, able to build a lot of infrastructure. He conquered many enemy armies. He was a bit of a, uh, an inventor, I guess. He developed some kind of a system for launching arrows or rocks or something, catapulting these things at the enemy and, and help drive them back. So he had a lot of success as a king. And sadly, it seemed that all of his, his glory and power as a king ultimately went to his head. He seemed to forget that it was God who had done this for him. It was God who had enabled the success that he experienced. Thus, his pride ultimately led to his downfall. In fact, he got to thinking he was so good that one day he decided he was just going to go into the temple and burn some incense. Now, you need to understand that that was strictly the priest's job. It wasn't something that just anybody should do. But hey, he was the king after all, right? I'm the king. I can do what I want. Or so he may be thought. But because of his pride and because specifically of that last very presumptuous act, what happened to him was, the Bible says that God inflicted him with leprosy. And this meant that he had to go off and live in a separate house by himself or maybe live in a house with some other people who were afflicted with leprosy. So he was still the king, but he was really the king in name only. He wasn't really able to do the job. His son had to step in and take over his duties, and it was really now his son who was in charge, who was you know, ruling the country. And so his pride had taken him from a very famous, very powerful, very respected king down to this outcast leper. And sadly, he remained a leper until he died. That's the way his story ends. 
Now, hopefully, though, he died uh, humbled and reconnected to God, but that's still how he died. It's a sad ending to his story, and it shows us the importance of humbleness, the importance of always putting God first for the long term, not just for a little while at the beginning of our relationship with God, but right through our complete life. You know what? Even when we're leading out in church, say, it's easy to become impressed as we look back with our accomplishments and forget sometimes that the credit primarily goes to God, doesn't it? We can look at the great things that we've done for God and on behalf of God. And you know, that's something that can sort of sneak up on you. And it's something that we need to be on guard against. And unfortunately, it seems Azariah wasn't. He let that grow within him till it was too late, till it overtook him and brought him down. So when Azariah died, Jotham officially became king. He was a little bit older than his father. He was 25 when he came to the throne, and he reigned for a much shorter time. He reigned for 16 years. However, remember, for all practical purposes, his reign was really longer than that because he had been doing the job for a while, we don't know how long, while his father was, you know, out of commission with leprosy. So Jotham. What do we know about Jotham? Well, basically, Jotham followed the Lord's way, and he too prospered. Let's look at a verse that describes his life and reign. If you're still there in 2 Chronicles, look at chapter 27, and verse 6. It gives a little summary statement about Jotham. <clears throat> 2 Chronicles 27, verse 6, says, So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. So here we see that following the Lord paid off, paid off in his life and in his reign. Now, um, Jotham had, had made the right choice in life, but unfortunately there is one thing that Jotham didn't do. He didn't address that uh, elephant in the room or elephant in the kingdom, so to speak. He didn't abolish the high places. And thus that problem with people worshiping at them and worshiping in a bad way at them continued. And you know, it's, it's really too bad that Jotham wasn't the one to, to step up and do that because you read the account of Jotham and his reign and it's, it's pretty good. It's too bad that he wasn't the one to finally correct that matter because I think if he had... He might have gone down in history as one of Judah's greatest all-time kings. But he, he shied away from that one. Nevertheless, I think what we can learn from Jotham is, is the simple but powerful truth that the best way is the Lord's way. It's the way he chose, and it was the best way. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me, it was during the reign of Jotham that the kings of Israel and Aram, or Syria, teamed up and they began plotting an attack on Judah. Because that's what you did, right? You got together and said, who can we go beat up and take over? And who can we oppress a little bit? So they were, they were working on that deal. And, and as we see that happen, I think it's important to note that while following the Lord and his ways makes you prosper in the long run and makes you prosper in the things that matter most from an eternal perspective, it doesn't guarantee that you will just float through life without having to face any trials or challenges. That's not what prospering is about. For the most part, both Azariah and Jotham were good, God-fearing, and God-following kings, but they still faced challenges and, and difficulties. Life wasn't all ease for them. They both had a number of wars to contend with, and here they've, they've got this big war looming. They, they know it's coming this, this uh, problem they're going to need to deal with while Jotham was reigning. As well, they had this ongoing problem of the inappropriate worship happening at the, at the high places. It's not that the kings themselves were doing it, but the people were still doing it. Not all of the people, but certainly some of the people in the kingdom were still involved in this kind of thing. The point here, though, is that God will help you face whatever comes your way, if you open your heart to him and you choose to follow him and you let him help you. When it says that God prospered these people, it didn't mean their life was always easy, but it meant that he helped them do what they needed to do. He helped them face the challenges. And so next on the scene comes Ahaz. Ahaz was 20 when he became king, and like his dad, he reigned for 16 years. Some might say 16 long years. It's just amazing how young some of these 
these uh, kings were when they ascended to the throne. But I suppose that's what can happen in times when you know, life expectancy was probably not as generous as it is for us in, in our current times today. So, how would we describe Ahaz? How would you describe Ahaz? How about this? This will be my shot at describing Ahaz. You can agree or disagree. I would say that Ahaz was a, um, Ahaz was a sadistic, mean jerk. That, okay? I mean, this guy was really evil. Really, read, read the story. I can imagine that he was probably the type of guy who as a kid enjoyed pulling the legs off insects just to watch them writhe around in tortured agony. I don't know, maybe some of you did that, and if you did, oh. But, you know, I mean, this guy was so cruel, he, he, he actually roasted, literally, a couple of his sons. Roasted them. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was sacrificing them like they used to do back in the days before God's people of Israel had taken over the land of Canaan. And he kind of thought, I guess, that would be kind of a cool thing to do. You know, roasted his sons. Just uh, fry them up today, and I guess it won't have them anymore. Like you probably didn't want to meet Ahaz in a dark alley. Probably didn't want to meet Ahaz, period, you know, anywhere, anytime. Well, needless to say, in case it isn't clear yet, he did not follow God. He was a lot more like too many of the kings of Israel. You may recall that the kingdom of Israel had divided in the past, and there was two parts to it now, two nations, the kingdom of Israel to the north and the kingdom of Judah to the south. And the record of the kings of Israel, as you read through Kings and Chronicles, is, is uh, it's not very nice a lot of the time. These uh, kings in Israel, they had been killing each other off to gain the position of king. Sometimes, you know, someone was the king for like six months, and boom, he was murdered, and someone else, and then boom, he was murdered, and not, not a very nice picture. And it seems like Ahaz would have been a better fit with those kings up in Israel. The Bible records that Israel was finally exiled by God because of their continuing sinful ways. I mean, they just, they just, they just totally derailed from following God. So Ahaz, he's not in Israel, though. He's down in Judah. And he tried to do everything against God. I mean, not only did he not worship God, but he was active in the opposite way. He went around making idols for worshiping the god Baal instead, so he encouraged people to worship other gods. He certainly did not address the problem of the, the worship happening at the high places. Instead, he made it worse. He let out in corrupt sacrifices at these high places. He, he you know, instituted new ones. He, he kind of took it to a higher or lower level, however you say that. I mean, he just made it worse. Now remember that we said the kings of uh, Syria and Israel had been plotting an attack on Judah. And so they finally got themselves organized enough and they started their war with Judah. And at first, the nation of Judah with King Ahaz, they were successful in holding them off. You know, he had, he had inherited a pretty strong, stable kingdom. But then, after a while, as the war continued, they started getting in trouble. Now this would have been a perfect time for Ahaz to stop and think seriously about his responsibilities, and think about his limitations, and think about his whole life direction, think about, think about the predicament that he was in. It would have been a perfect time for him to finally turn to the Lord in repentance and humbleness and seek divine help. But did he do that? Oh no. Instead, he turned to man. Specifically, he turned to the king of Assyria for help. And so what he dreamed up in his mind was he went and he took all the gold and silver from the temple and a bunch of the money in the treasuries and, and he went off to try to bribe the king of Assyria to come and help him, help his nation Judah who was being oppressed in this war. Well, how did that work? He was a real loser to do this, frankly, because for the most part he just lost his money or more specifically he lost Judah's money. He, he really, in the end, got conned, and it's questionable if Assyria ever really helped him much. Yes, in the immediate term, they said, oh, okay. And they, um, you know, they did attack one of Judah's enemies, 
but that was likely more about Assyria seeing an opportunity to further its own interests by taking advantage of a nation who was busy occupied with another war somewhere else. That was probably a lot more about that than it was about, oh, let's go help Judah, poor little Judah. I mean, think about it. Here you are, you can't handle the pressure from these smaller nations, so you try to cut a deal with the big, powerful nation to help you. Oh yeah, Assyria was happy to take Judah's treasure, hand it on over, sounds like a good deal. But let's face it, if they didn't live up to their side of the bargain, I mean, really, who's going to make them? Who's going to hold them to account? I can't deal with Israel and Syria, so Assyria, we, you know, we, made, a, we made a deal, you better, you better stay helping us. Really? You and who is going to make them do that? So ultimately, Judah was defeated. But believe it or not, Ahaz still hadn't learned. Next, he got the bright idea that maybe what he should do is start to worship the gods of the nations that had just, you know, defeated him. And I guess his thinking was that if those gods had helped those other nations, then they would probably help him too if he would just worship those same gods. And so he went up there and he did some research and he got a drawing of an amazing big altar that was used to worship these other gods. He even went so far as to instruct that the bronze altar from the temple be brought out of the temple, and they placed it over sort of on the side by this other big altar that he had sent down directions for how to have built so that they could worship other gods. And he ultimately closed the temple, and the Bible says he provoked the Lord to anger, which I'd like to suggest to you takes a lot. Well, finally, Ahaz was killed. Sadly, he had brought down the nation of Judah with him. His whole life really had been a disaster. Spent all of his time resisting God. It's, It's actually amazing, I think, that he lasted as long as he did. And you have to wonder, you know, if he had just, you know, what would he have been able to do if he had just chosen to follow God? Might have done great things. What a difference it would have made, not only for himself, but for Judah as a whole. The nation he ruled would have been in much, much better condition. Now, just as an interesting hypothetical aside that I got pondering this week, rightly or wrongly, I was thinking, you know, now, if Ahaz were to be alive today, and let's say, say he was to be, I don't know, say an NHL hockey player, I wonder what team he might fit in best with. You know, I just got thinking about that this week, hearing some of the things I heard. I don't know, maybe it's a little too sensitive time right now to speculate on things like that around these parts, but, you know, I just got thinking, oh, the poor Maple Leafs, you know, they have enough problems without adding Ahaz to their headaches. But you know what? It just seemed like he he chose the wrong course. Words uh, words going to get me after, but that's okay. Oh, Ahaz, Ahaz. What a guy. So anyways, Judah's in bad shape. And 25-year-old Hezekiah begins his 29-year reign. Now Hezekiah was a good king. He was a king who followed the Lord closely. And one thing you could say for him, he certainly did not procrastinate. In the very first month of his reign, he got things going. Can you guess what he did first? Yeah. What he did first is he removed the high places. I mean, finally, finally someone did after generations and generations and generations of kind of pretending that problem wasn't there. He just like started out and got rid of that thing. Smashed all the idols that Ahaz had made. He got something going we could call operation to purify the temple. I mean, he was a good leader. He seemed to have a way of inspiring the people. So the temple was cleansed. It was set in order. It was purified in record time. All of the defilement that had happened in that temple was cleaned up and removed even faster than Hezekiah originally thought that it could be. And so they were so happy it was done right away, they held a big purification from sin offering. Is that what you do when you're happy, have an offering? And then he had a huge Passover celebration and invited people from Israel and all the surrounding nations to come and join in this worship of God. Even these nations that had been fighting with them and and oppressing them, he said, you know what, we're worshiping God now. We're worshiping the God we the way we should, and so come on, you're welcome to come and join us in worshiping God the proper way. I like Hezekiah, he was, he was dynamic, he was organized, and he clearly knew what he was doing. And so we should read a, a few verses about him, about Hezekiah. Go to the other record of the, the kings, 2 Kings chapter 18. 
And let's look at what it says beginning at verse 5. 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 5, kind of gives us a little insight into the type of person that Hezekiah was. And if I get to 2 Kings instead of 1 Kings, this will make more sense. 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning at verse 5. Speaking of Hezekiah, it says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any who were before him. For he, he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. I mean, this presents a good model of how we who our Christians should live our lives trusting God and don't depart from following him. It's not rocket science, but it's a pretty good way to live your life. And it's quite a statement that we read there about Hezekiah, that there was never another king in Judah like him. That's a remarkable statement. In 2 Chronicles 31, 21, it says that in everything he did to serve God and everything he did to follow God's commandments, Hezekiah did it with all of his heart, and he prospered. Hezekiah was a man who was truly dedicated to God. However, life goes on. And in due time, Assyria came down and attacked Judah. Because they found out that, that you know, getting money from other countries was kind of a nice thing. And this is what big, powerful, dominant nations did. They attacked smaller surrounding nations, leaving them with two options. Option A was pay enough bullies pay enough bullies, pay enough money to get the bullies to leave you alone for a little while. That was one option you could choose. The second option was try to resist and be demolished and slaughtered. So pay up or die. Those are the choices you had. Nice choices, right? Remember that Hezekiah had not particularly inherited a wealthy country with deep reserves after the reign of uh, his predecessor. Ahaz had pretty well depleted the money in the treasuries, trying to win over the favor of the Assyrians, who ironically are here now not helping Judah whatsoever, but instead threatening and demanding. Demanding more, more money, more payment, or else Judah would pay the brutal consequences. So Hezekiah was left with little choice. He had to take the gold and other things from the temple, pay the ransom required to get the Assyrians to leave. He was in no position to fight back against them. But fast forward a little bit, and now, not surprisingly, here comes Assyria again. You know, as long as you kept paying your money every year, these countries would kind of leave you alone. As soon as you suggested that maybe you weren't interested in paying them tribute this year, they would come down for a little visit, a little chat. Not really a chat, a little more than that. And so here they are again, and they're ready to have war with Judah because Judah is not interested in perpetually paying out to them. And under Hezekiah's leadership, Judah and the city of Jerusalem were stronger now. And it was to the point where the Assyrians couldn't just waltz in and take over the city so easily. So what they did is they came down and they, they took out a number of the, the smaller towns and villages on the way to make a statement. And when they got... To the capital there, what they did was set up camp a ways out from the city, and the tactic they used was to send some people into the walls of Jerusalem to try to scare the people, try to, to try to unnerve them. And so these guys would come, and they would stand outside the walls talking to official representatives from Judah, and they would say things like, you know, why, why are you guys listening to Hezekiah? What's wrong with you? Come on, your God is not going to help you. Look at, look at all of the other countries that we've defeated. And they could, they could lay out a pretty long list of countries that were defeated. And said, well, you know, what did their gods do? You know, they were all just like you. They all would say, oh, our, our gods are going to help us. And look at what happened. Look at how we pounded them. They proclaimed that the king of Assyria was greater than the god of Judah. They were just uh, obnoxious. They were intimidating. And they were very intentional in what they said. And to add insult to injury, the scare tactic went even further. The king of Assyria, who I guess had nothing better to do, sent letters to King Hezekiah. Sent these obnoxious letters, arrogant letters, ridiculing Judah, ridiculing Judah's God. 
But what's interesting as we read the story is that Hezekiah's faith in God in this situation remains strong. Look at, I want us to look at what he, the one last text to look at, back to 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 8. It's a time of national crisis. And look at what Hezekiah did and what he said. 2 Chronicles 32 verse 8. This is, this is Hezekiah talking to his people about the very real and imminent threat of the Assyrians who are just out there waiting to do drastic damage, threatening, intimidating. And Hezekiah here is talking about the king of Assyria to his people. 2 Chronicles 32, verse 8, and he says, With him, that is with the king of Assyria, is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah king of Judah. I mean, Hezekiah courageously trusted in the Lord. He asked God for deliverance, and boy, did God respond. That night, the record says that God sent an angel, one angel, who annihilated the fighting men and most of the leaders of the Assyrian army. Remarkably, 185,000 men wiped out in one night. You don't think God is powerful? That's just God's angel, you know? Well, the Assyrian king woke up if he slept through all of that, and he noticed that he was one of the few still living. So he, uh, he took off. He ran home scared to death. And what became of him, just to follow up with the rest of the story of the king of Assyria? Well, he got home there for a while, and one day two of his sons came up to him and just uh, chopped him up, literally cut him to pieces. Kind of like, I guess we're done with you, Dad. Let's just kill you. Tragic. Tragic end. Here is this man who had arrogantly put himself before God, proclaimed loud and long that he was more powerful, he was better than Judah's God, and where did all of his great power get him? His own sons murdered him without warning. But it was a miraculous deliverance for the people of Judah, and we have here an example, I think, of how much better a situation can be when everyone works together and everyone supports each other. You know, Azariah and Jotham, they followed the Lord, but the people were not as dedicated. They were still partly clinging to their sinful ways and practices. However, when Hezekiah became king, he was able to build some kind of a strong unity among the people. And when they all worked together, when they all really consecrated themselves to God, when they truly dedicated themselves to following God's ways, the results were not just good, the results were outstanding and astounding. The nation had not been as pure and spiritually strong probably since the days of King David. And when they were faced with this terrifying crisis of the Assyrians, they kept their faith strong and secure in the Lord and they were miraculously delivered. And regrettably, sometimes it doesn't it seem that things have to get as bad as they did under Ahaz before people really decide to get serious about committing their lives to God? Isn't that the case? It's sometimes like we've got to get down to the bottom, you know, Nowhere left to go, and then we, then we consider following God really wholeheartedly? What a hard way to do things. How much better if we could unify and dedicate ourselves to God before things generate to such a horrible state. We would be happier, and the work in progress in spreading the gospel would proceed much better instead of always being in crisis mode. Hezekiah turned to God and was faithful. God saved him in his country. Ahaz turned to man, rebelled against God. He died leaving his country in a mess. Well, the story continues that in those days Hezekiah got sick. The Lord told the prophet Isaiah to go tell the king that time had come. His time had come. He was going to die. But Hezekiah, like most of us humans, he desired, he was programmed to desire life. He didn't want to die. And so he asked, he pled with the Lord to let him live longer. And the record says that before Isaiah had even left the, the temple or the palace precincts, God told him, okay, go back. Go back with another message for Hezekiah. Tell him that he will live for 15 more years. Now, this was a pretty big deal. In fact, it was a life and death deal to Hezekiah. So he wanted a sign. He wanted to make sure that this thing was real. He wanted to confirm this 16 more, or 15 more years of life deal. And so he asked for the shadow as it was moving down the steps where he was laying there. He asked that the shadow could go back 10 steps. And the shadow is going to keep going forward. But if it goes back, I mean, that's, that's not normal, right? Something's going on there. 
And so Isaiah asked the Lord to grant that sign to confirm the promise to Hezekiah. And sure enough, the shadow retreated 10 steps. And sure enough, Hezekiah lived for another 15 years. Can you imagine that? Knowing you're going to live for 15 years and you get to year 14? Kind of, kind of weird. Now there was a time, just to give the full disclosure of Hezekiah's life, there was a time after this miraculous healing when Hezekiah became too proud of himself. Kind of like his, you know, in the footsteps of his great-grandfather. And the Bible says that he angered God. It just goes to show that even a life of consistent faithfulness does not make us immune to the danger of getting sidetracked from a solid saving connection with Christ. You might have served God faithfully for the last 49 and years and six months or whatever, but, you know, that doesn't mean you just cruise to the end. Past commitment always has to be fortified with present focus and humble dedication. That's the reality. Well, thankfully, Hezekiah was willing to realize and acknowledge his mistake, repent of his actions and attitude, and he was able to receive forgiveness from God. And once back on track with the Lord, he again prospered along with his country and its people by following God's laws. You know, there's quite a contrast to some of these men and the lives that they lived. And I believe that the record of their lives has been preserved in the Bible for our instruction, for our warning, for our encouragement. And the lessons that we can learn from them are probably not anything earth-shattering new to, to you if you're a Christian. You know, it's, it's probably nothing that you haven't heard in how many sermons and devotional readings and talks before, right? But nevertheless, they are still the most foundational, basic lessons that have implications for life right from now clear through to eternity. They're easy enough for a kid to understand these lessons, and yet they continue to challenge the real lives of even seasoned, mature Christians. You know, the smartest thing you can do is just follow God, be under His care and leadership. It's easy to say, real life, Day by day, you ever challenged? I am. Azariah became too proud, too self-focused, and sadly, after a life of many great accomplishments, he died powerless and a leper. There's a lesson there. Jotham simply followed God and prospered. I think there's a lesson there. Ahaz always went against God. Instead, of, instead he turned to man and other gods to help him out. He destroyed not only himself, but also the country that he was supposed to lead. There's a lesson there. The king of Assyria proclaimed that he was greater than God. His army was squished like a grape, and he was slaughtered. Probably a lesson there. Of the men that we've considered today, I think Hezekiah provides the best model to follow. He clung to the Lord. He kept his faith. And when he got off track, he reconnected with God, and he accepted his forgiveness. And because, his dedicated and, because of his dedicated and courageous commitment to the Lord, he prospered along with his nation. The kingdom of Judah was saved from the Assyrians. Hezekiah was given 15 extra years of life. I believe that the lives of these men demonstrate a truth as valid for us today as it was for them so long ago. And that is simply that the best way to live your life is God's way. No great astounding announcement, but the best way to live, it is great actually, the best way to live your life is God's way. Because he will bless you. And he will make you to prosper. And I close with the words of Proverbs 3, 6. Remember these words that say, in all your ways acknowledge him. and He shall direct your paths. Let's think about that commitment as we sing our, our closing hymn. Oh, let me walk with thee. 